Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. The recent scathing report by the Department of Justice on the Minneapolis Police Department once again brings the issue of police reform to the forefront. As we enter a long, hot summer, some of these fundamental issues will surely come to the surface. And crime and law enforcement will certainly be a part of the endless 2024 presidential campaign. And yet few areas of public policy are more prone to contradiction than law enforcement. We want public safety, yet we're suspicious of the police who are on the front lines. The police want to do their job, but are sometimes overzealous, are criticized, and are often angered by the very people they are there to protect and to serve. We need more people willing to take on the job of policing, yet the self-selecting population of those that are willing to do it are often not the best fit. Our media culture is saturated by stories about police and law enforcement, yet it seems to have very little impact on the daily reality of the interaction of law enforcement and the community. How do we bridge any of these divides, and how do we find the right cultural, social, an economic framework for real police reform, not just a Band-Aid, but real reform. My guest, Neil Gross, has devoted his work to trying to figure this out. Once referred to as one of the most interesting sociologists of his generation, he is a former cop and a distinguished academic known for his research on higher education, politics, and academic life. He is currently the Charles A. Dana Professor of Sociology at Colby College in Maine, a frequent contributor to the New York Times. He holds degrees in legal studies and sociology and has taught at Harvard, USC, and Princeton. His recent book is Walk the Walk, How Three Police Chiefs Defied the Odds and Changed Cop Culture. It is my pleasure to welcome Neil Gross here to the Who, What, Why podcast. Neil, thanks so much for joining us. Jeff, thanks for having me. It is a delight to have you here. Police work is one of those professions more than most where the culture of the profession, the culture of, of those that engage in it, seems to be such a large part of it. Talk about that first. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, by, the, by the culture of the profession, you know, we mean the, the norms, the values, the everyday ways of doing things that cops employ. And one reason that uh, culture looms so large in policing is because the police have an awful lot of discretion. You know, if you think about it, uh, cops abide by rules and laws and are supposed to enforce those laws. Uh, but by necessity, they have to exercise a lot of judgment in terms of uh, that enforcement, right? Someone is speeding. Should they get a ticket if they're going one mile over the speed limit, two miles over the speed limit? Uh, there's this constant question of, uh, of what and how much law should you uh, enforce? And add to that the fact that you know, most police officers work e- either alone or with a partner. Usually there's not a supervisor present on the scene. So uh, it's often the case that the, the norms and values and worldview that they learn, that they pick up uh, as part of their occupational socialization uh, uh, is very influential in shaping how they act on the street and, and their reaction to various attempts at reform. The other thing that, that is a key factor is the community in which they work and what the culture and values of that community happen to be. You know, that's right. One of the, uh, uh, I guess, ideas behind uh, a highly decentralized law enforcement apparatus of the kind we have in the U.S. is that, uh, you know, in principle, the, the culture and mores of a particular community are supposed to influence uh, the way that officers enforce the law, the kinds of things that they care about, that they don't care about, uh, and so on. And, you know, that works well in some circumstances um, and less well in others, uh, you know, in a community where uh, there's a great deal of racial animus, for example. Um, we don't want officers, obviously, to uh, pick up those those elements from the community. So, yes, there is often a lot of crossover. Um, on the other hand, it's also the case that police officers don't always live in the communities uh, where they work. And the research suggests that uh, the more the barriers exist between police and the community, the, the more uh, the police uh, it's kind of don't come from uh, the neighborhoods they police, don't have a lot of interactions outside their official duties with people in communities, uh, the, the worse the policing that they deliver. So, yeah, that community piece is pretty important. What impact do you think popular culture has on policing, the way it's portrayed in the media, in television, in movies? Well, I think that... Um, I'm sure that there are some number of uh, police officers who went into the profession because they liked what they saw on, on TV shows and thought that policing was going to be very much like that. 
Uh, and of course, it's not uh, not hard to imagine that there are huge gaps between uh, you know what's what's shown on um, on TV and um, what uh, the, the reality of the job is. Uh, in reality, police work is um, has a, a a great deal of a monotony uh, interspersed with with moments of panic. That's how it's often described. Uh, it's there's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, it's um, it's a, 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 a dirty and a kind of difficult business. Uh, in the sense that you're, um, you know, out in, uh, out in, uh, you know, dirty conditions sometimes, uh, you know, you know uh, mud and all that stuff. Um, so it, it's, it doesn't have necessarily the glamour, as what I'm saying, that uh, that's shown on TV. Um, so I do think that sometimes people enter the profession and expect it to be one thing and, and find that it's uh, something really quite different. Talk about what you found in terms of people that do enter the profession, the people that decide to be police officers. It is a very obviously self-selecting population. Can we paint with a broad brush in terms of those that decide to pursue that profession? Uh, well, it's changed over the years in terms of its uh, its demographic composition. Um, you know, policing has historically been uh, a working class occupation. Uh, and uh, it has often been uh, a, a, a source and site of, of social mobility, uh, particularly once civil service rules uh, were enacted, um, you know, earlier in the in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and so, you know, as as, as you've seen, new groups of uh, you know, members of the working class kind of cycle through the American system. Uh, some number of them have gone into law enforcement, and then they've often used that as a as a stepping stone. It's kind of a good. A good government job uh, into you know the, the the middle class for themselves and for their families. Uh, so you know you saw uh, generations of you know Irish cops, for example, in 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 the Northeast, uh, and now you're seeing um, a, a real diversification in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, uh, so working class, uh, the educational uh, qualifications of the police have been growing over time as the country has become more educated. So now something like 40 percent of American police officers uh, have bachelor's degrees. That varies by by location, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, gender, uh, that's one thing that hasn't changed very much. It, 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 there, there was an increase in the number of uh, female police officers uh, that's leveled off. Uh, so now we're looking at around 12 percent. Uh, nationally, uh, there's a real push now to to get that up much higher uh, to 30 percent by by 2030. So, you know, th- those are some of the the, the the demographic features. You know, on other factors, um, law enforcement has historically been a very conservative uh, occupation, uh, not exclusively so, uh, but uh, to a large extent, uh, there are cross cutting pressures there. So, when people enter the profession um, from um, you know minority communities, for example, who might have uh, more progressive views on on race, uh, you know, that that can kind of cross cut the, the natural tendency for uh, a good deal of conservatism in uh, in law enforcement. Um, so those are, I would say, some of its its most salient features. And what role does education play, do we find, in shaping the culture of these departments? No, that's a great question. Um, certainly many of the calls for reform over the years have uh, been to have the police and the OSB be, be better educated. Um, you know, going back all the way to the early years of the 20th century, one of the leading figures of police reform back then, um, the chief in, in Berkeley, California, a guy named August Vollmer, uh, pushed you know, when, when almost nobody was going to college for you know officers to have some kind of college education. He thought that would be uh, beneficial, uh, particularly for uh, for detectives. Um, and as we've seen, uh, you know, waves of uh, of upset and uh, unrest, I should say, about uh, police uh, abuses. Um, there have been persistent calls to increase the educational qualifications of, of uh, the police uh, in the U.S. You know, I would say that the data on this is um, a little bit ambiguous. Uh, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, police with more education um, use force less uh, and are uh, less likely to make arrests for minor offenses. The other hand, there's some other evidence to suggest that um, cops with more education tend to be uh, more effective at whatever job they are assigned. Uh, and so if uh, they're in departments where the goal, the, the assigned task is kind of stop and frisk everybody and make as many arrests as you can, uh, then the evidence suggests that educated police uh, tend to, to do that more effectively than their less educated counterparts. Um, so uh, on the whole, the evidence is a little bit ambiguous, but I would say that there's a real interest now uh, in trying to get uh, police with uh, more uh, college education. The difficulty, of course, is that 
there's a tremendous recruitment crisis in policing right now, uh, and it's hard to get uh, anyone uh, to enter law enforcement, much less people with uh, college degrees who might well have uh, lots of other better paying uh, job opportunities. One of the other things that impact these departments, as you talk about profoundly and walk the walk, is the leadership of the department. Talk about that as it relates to these three police departments that you look at in the book. So policing uh, is uh, has been historically and, and remains to a large extent uh, a paramilitary organization. Um, and we can talk about the, the uh, cl- uh, arguments about whether the police have become overly militarized. Uh, but, uh, but to some extent, it, it is a, a, an organization with uh, a very strong uh, rank and command structure. Uh, and one of the there are downsides to that, of course. Um, one of the upsides is that uh, police officers really do look to those at the top of their organizations for leadership. Uh, they, they want direction. They want uh, someone to tell them uh, in general, uh, you know, what sorts of orders they should be following. And they look for leaders who um, they find to be credible and strong cops and you know, op- leaders who will have their back and uh, are virtuous and those kinds of things. You know, I found uh, in doing research for this book that departments that were able to really alter their cultures in a meaningful way, not to uh, necessarily uh, uh, change everything about them, but to uh, but to emphasize more of the positive qualities of police culture and de-emphasize the negative qualities. One thing that they all shared was uh, really visionary leadership, uh, folks who um, had ascended to the role of police chief and had um, uh, unusual qualities that made them uh, see the world differently, uh, be more open to input from different sectors of their community and gave them the real organizational know-how to be able to uh, not just come up with good ideas for how their department should change, but really make sure that they got thorough implementation uh, on the ground. So in policing, in general, leadership is very important. And uh, in changing the culture of a police department, leadership is doubly important. What about in those situations? And I want to talk about the three positive ones, the three that you look at in the book. But what about those situations where there is a constant tension between the police, the police unions, and the leadership of these police departments? And we've seen that in various places in the country. It's a huge challenge. Uh, One of the difficulties uh, with changing the police in in this country uh, has to do with how we've structured the police chief role. You know, in many cities, uh, police chiefs are appointed by, by mayors or by the city council. Uh, and these are often at will appointments. Uh, so the idea is you're going to come in, you're going to serve until they don't want you to serve anymore. The average tenure for big city police chiefs is three to five years. And typically what will happen in a city that's been experiencing uh, real tensions between the police and the community is that the mayor or city manager or city council will, will bring in a police chief uh, with the explicit promise of reforming the department. Uh, they're brought in that sets up intense tensions. Uh, between the cops, the union, and the chief. Uh, oftentimes, these are appointments from outside the department, and so uh, the chief doesn't necessarily have the benefit of that insider knowledge and that insider credibility. Uh, and the result of those tensions is that uh, whatever efforts at police reform are made are essentially rebuffed by the union or by cops on the ground. Um, so uh, th- that's a problem. Uh, you know, If we want to really make headway with police reform, we probably need to change the way that police chiefs are appointed and also our expectations for how quickly they're going to be able to make change. One thing I found in uh, the three cities that I looked at closely was that the chiefs really took a long time, uh, uh, you know, 10 years in the case of one of my examples, which is Stockton, California, which is a city that had a, a, a certainly a troubled relationship between the police and various communities there. Um, in other places, it, it took even longer than that. Um, Policing is a big ship, I, I often say. Uh, it's, it's slow to turn. Uh, and you know, if we're constantly cycling uh, new chiefs in and out, uh, it makes it very, very hard to, to gain real traction with reform. Why is it so difficult to change? Why is it like that proverbial big ship that you're talking about? Well, many institutions are difficult to change. You know, I work in higher education, and um, uh, we we certainly don't turn on a dime either. Um, uh, You know, think about uh, how long uh, you know it takes to change. uh, You know, how long it took to to bring about changes in the Catholic Church, for example. Um, So, uh, I don't think policing is unique in being slow to change. Uh, I do think that um, one of the um, things about it that makes it slow to change uh, is that. 
you know, officers get extremely wedded to their routines, to their ways of doing things. And of course, this is true in, in many occupations, um, but it, that may be so even more for policing. And I think one reason for that is because um, you know, policing is a very, uh, it's a job that has a lot of uncertainty associated with it, a lot of anxiety associated with it and stress. And one thing that habits do very well and routines is they alleviate uh, anxiety and stress uh, because they provide a clear path for, for people to follow um, when uh, when confusing or difficult situations arise. Um, so uh, officers are, are very uh, eager to cling to their to their routines. And I, and I do think that that poses a particular challenge for change. Now, it's not as though they don't change. Um, if you look back at the history of policing, there have been many, many uh, really dramatic changes over time uh, and many measurable improvements. Um, but it is often a hard task to convince officers to change. And, and the joke that you know chiefs will often tell is that the only thing that cops hate more than uh, than change is is the way things are now. Um, so you know, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you're a police leader and you you want to produce change, so I, I do think that um, uh, that organizational teams are probably more a uh, persistent feature. Um, of law enforcement than at least some other occupations. And how much does that have to do with the inherent risk in police work, that because of that risk, routines somehow add to the perception of safety? I, I think that's an important part of, the, uh, of it, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the, the challenge here is that, you know, humans are not necessarily very good at, at calculating risks. Uh, and, you know, we, we, you know, think about all, this all, all the time. If you think about, you know, people who are afraid of flying, right? It's a, it's a very high, uh, uh, a plane crash is a very high impact risk. And so people get very worried about it. Um, but of course it's, you know, vanishingly rare. Uh, thank goodness. Um, you know, in law enforcement, uh, uh, it is a risky profession. Um, you know, something like one out of every 12 officers is assaulted every year. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, officer deaths aren't uh, aren't hugely common. Um, something like 50 or 60 on average per year from, um, from assaults. There are more from, um, from, uh, uh, traffic accidents and the like. Certainly there are many more from COVID. Um, so officers have, um, uh, sometimes a not clear sense for how risky the job is. And their risk perceptions will also change over the course of their career. So when you first start out and you have very little experience, uh, and you're told in the police academy that, you know, officer safety has to come first. Uh, that has to be the, you know, job number one in every situation. Uh, and that, you know, every, in every citizen encounter is potentially, uh, incredibly, uh, uh risky and, and a lethal threat to you. You know, then officers feel this tremendous sense of anxiety. You know, typically as they gain more experience, uh, and a little bit more maturity, they become better at discerning what are situations that involve real risk. And what are situations that involve uh, that, that where it might seem like there's a risk, but where there actually isn't a risk. But yeah, I, I do think that that partially uh, pushes officers into more of a of a routinized response. And of course, the challenge there is that you know those routines and habits um, can be really effective when they're applied to the right kind of situation. But oftentimes, um, officers will end up um, uh, making a, a tragic mistake uh, when they apply. Uh, a set of routines to a situation that it doesn't fit, right? So when they, like a classic example of this would be, you know, thinking that somebody has uh, has a weapon um, uh, and, you know, maybe even a deploying lethal force um, because that's kind of what you're supposed to do when you, you know, in a situation in which you expect someone to have a weapon and then it turns out that there is no weapon. So um, I, I do think that that, that you know, the, the question of how to fit the routines to the actual reality of situations that officers deal with uh, is a real challenge. And then the other part of that is that, you know, social circumstances change, right? Um, people's behaviors evolve over time. Communities evolve and change over time. Uh, and if officers aren't a little bit more flexible in their routines uh, and habits, then they can't be uh, flexible and appropriate in um, responding to the changing needs of the community. So part of that is a question of efficacy. And part of that is just a question of democratic accountability, right? Are the officers going to behave in the way that um, is is appropriate and responsive to where the community is at right now? What about the binary nature of the work, the perception that there's good guys and bad guys? It seems to be less shades of gray in police work. Yeah, I, I think that some of that, again, has to do with the nature of the job. Um, officers are forced to make really quick assessments of, of people uh, and to act on those perceptions. Um, you know, I, I think that as officers get a little bit more experience, they 
you know, they, they do recognize those shades of gray. Um, they recognize that, uh, you know, someone, uh, can, can be having a bad day, uh, you know, isn't necessarily a bad person. Uh, you know, at the same time, um, officers see, they see extremes. Uh, uh I'm definitely not the first person to say this, but, you know, uh, if you, especially if you don't live in a community uh, and you're an officer, you know, most of what you're seeing are, are people, uh, who, um, uh, are having really bad days. Uh, or who've done something really bad. Um, if, if all you're doing is responding to 911 calls, um, you know, you may be dealing constantly with, you know, traffic accidents, uh, uh, domestic disputes, uh, people experiencing uh, mental health crises, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or criminal activity. Um, and, and you may have little interaction with the uh, members of the community who are not having those bad days right then. And so, you know, it can sometimes create this skewed perception that, you know, there's, there's people who, um, are, uh, are uh, for whom everything's great. And then there's people who, you know, there's something going on with them. Uh, so I think that that, that contributes to the binary nature of the occupation. But again, the best police officers, um, you know, don't fall prey to those kinds of traps. Talk about these three towns that you focus on, Stockton, California, and Longmont, Colorado, and, and LaGrange, Georgia, and what the similarities were in terms of what those police chiefs did to try and bring reform to those departments. And so I, I chose these uh, communities um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they're, they're all really different. So Stockton is um, a medium-sized city, about 320,000 in the Central Valley. Longmont, Colorado, about 100,000. It's becoming more of a suburb. It's sort of a high plains town near Boulder. And then LaGrange, Georgia is a community of about 30,000 an hour outside of Atlanta near the Alabama state line. Um, so they're different in size. Uh, they're different uh, politically. Um, uh, you know, Stockton's, uh, more moderate. I think Boulder's, uh, has, has historically been more conservative. It's trending, um, more, uh, more liberal, uh, more progressive, um, with the state of Colorado. And then, you know, LaGrange is, is, uh, kind of split. It's, uh, roughly half white and half black. Uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, and so it has both a, a Democratic and a, and a Republican, uh, constituency in the town. Um, so very different kinds of communities. Uh, and, and I wanted to profile um, agencies that were doing different things. But secondly, um, the chiefs all pursued very different kinds of agendas for reform. Um, they all were interested in policy change. They all you know, did important things like uh, restricting use of force uh, in ways that it hadn't been uh, there before in uh, trying to improve training, those sorts of things. Those are kind of standard police reform models. But Either they had the sense when they started their tenures as chief or they developed the sense over time that uh, it wasn't enough to change policy, that uh, you couldn't make real progress with reform unless you also uh, really tried to shift the culture of the department. And so that became a, a concerted goal for, for many of them. Now, lots of chiefs around the country have, have tried to alter the culture of their departments. Uh, many have been unsuccessful. Um, but these three chiefs actually achieved a degree of success, probably more so in Longmont and LaGrange, uh, although there was a real change in Stockton as well. Uh, and I wanted to profile that and figure out, you know, how did they do it, right? What, what's the, what's the, um, the model that we might follow if we really want to um, improve the culture of police departments and, and thereby improve policing? And was there a specific model? Were there things that each of them did that either in, in, in terms of example, or even by accident, things that they did that work, that were effective. You mentioned leadership earlier, and uh, that was really important for all three chiefs. They, they all had a, a degree of credibility or developed a degree of credibility with their officers. And uh, and that was important. Um, you know, if you're trying to change the culture of a police department, it's it's crucial that officers have um, some trust in their in their chief. Uh, now, that's not to say in all three agencies that all the cops uh, love their chiefs. There was often a lot of pushback. Um, and, uh, and you know, in the case of um, a couple of the agencies, some real um, uh, derision directed toward the chiefs for some of the reforms that they were trying to enact. Um, but the chiefs had a degree of, of, of credibility and respect with the officers, and, and that was extremely helpful. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, you know, one thing I found was that the, the chiefs were were uh, were very creative and open to new ideas about what policing might look like. Um, and uh, at least in the case of Stockton and Lagrange, the chiefs really didn't go into their jobs thinking that they were going to be changing the culture of the department necessarily. Uh, in Stockton, um, the chief there, Eric Jones, uh, uh, took the took the helmet in 2012. 
And his goal was to um, bring down Stockton's um, murder rate, which uh, had, had spiked in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, and in LaGrange, uh, when uh, Chief Lou Deckmar took over in the mid-90s, his goal was to really professionalize the department, uh, to you know, bring it up to, uh, to national standards in terms of uh, policies and, and procedures. Uh, so there's an element of culture change there. But you know, neither of them uh, had an interest in kind of altering the traditional culture of policing at first. But then both evolved toward recognizing the importance of that. In, in Stockton, Jones found that uh, it was really hard for him to implement his major crime prevention strategy if there wasn't more trust between the police and the community. And he recognized that that required uh, that uh, the cops uh, changed the way that they interacted with community residents. And in LaGrange, uh, Lou Deckmar um, uh, eventually became quite open to uh, calls that he heard in the community for some meaningful effort at reconciliation between the police department, which uh, is uh, largely white, um, and uh, LaGrange's large uh, uh, majority black community. Um, and he, he's a, a fairly conservative guy. And initially, those ideas of kind of reconciliation um, uh, uh, sounded uh, a little bit like kind of uh, racial sensitivity training. So he was uh, a little bit resistant at first, but he became open uh, to uh, to that and to paying attention to the importance of, um, you know, the police sort of owning what they'd done in the past and, and really trying to make amends for them. So in, in these places, it was a combination of leadership, uh, real vision, um, and an openness to ideas that were emerging from the community about, about how policing might be better in a way that uniquely fit that, that, that city. Did there also need to be a desire to change on the part of the communities or on the part of the police departments themselves, the rank and file officers. Was there a desire for change that was at the core of any of this? Certainly there was a desire for change in all three of my communities from uh, certain quarters of the community. Uh, so in, in, in Stockton, there was a uh, real upset uh, at um, the level of police violence there. And, and also I should uh, not hesitate to add uh, real upset at um, the inability of the police to effectively uh, bring down the rate of violence in Stockton. Um, so th- there was a, a, a desire for change there. Uh, uh, in uh, in Longmont, um, where Chief Mike Butler um, uh, took over after serving a long time as uh, second in command for, for Boulder PD, um, he uh, found that there was also a considerable effort at uh, uh, at, at a considerable demand for change that was being produced. Uh, and this took the form of, um, of real anger in Longmont's Latino community toward uh, a history of, of racism uh, in that department. Uh, and in LaGrange too, uh, people um, had, had, had memories and had, you know, very recent experiences of uh, racism and, uh, and, um, and uh, poor behavior from LaGrange cops. So from the communities, yes. From the d- police departments, no. Uh, the, the demand for change came from um, the community. Finally, talk about the way in which these departments, the, the rank and file in the departments, were brought around. Was it just leadership? Was it pressure from the community? Was it a combination of things? I think it was a combination. Uh, that's always the case. Um, you know, uh, certainly the leadership was was important. Uh, uh, the the chiefs didn't just come up with one idea. They had a lot of ideas. They were persistent in their efforts. Uh, and over time, um, as they evolved their department, they let, uh, they let the, the officers, uh, come up with, uh, ideas, new ideas, and, and often listen to their suggestions. Um, so it started with the chiefs, uh, eventually, uh, you know, officers became important makers of change themselves. Um, but I do think that in none of the three communities would change have been possible without, uh, not only the demand for change, um, from the cities, but also, uh, a, a real engagement with the police department. And I think one thing that we sometimes do in this country is um, get uh, very angry with the police uh, when um, incidents of abuse uh, 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 appear uh, and we demand that they change and we might vote in place politicians who we think are gonna make that change. And then we just go about our business uh, and kind of wash our hands of the whole affair. Um, and uh, And that's, not an effective way to to get change in in local government uh, as anyone who deals with you know school boards um, or engagements with you know school superintendents knows um, you know you have to be in there uh, citizens have to be in there trying to influence things uh, trying to have meaningful dialogue trying to actually push 
uh, the agency in a better direction. Um, and in um, in many of these communities, there were citizens who stepped forth and were, were really willing to do that once the chiefs proved willing to engage. Uh, in, in LaGrange, for example, I mentioned this effort at racial reconciliation. Well, that came about because uh, a group of civic leaders uh, decided that um, it was really time to build some uh, trust um, and more trust between uh, LaGrange's white and black communities. Um, this was a town that had had uh, de facto segregated swimming pools, but only barely de facto um, into the early 90s. Um, so, uh, and a tremendous history of, of racism, uh, Troop County, which it's uh, part of was the fifth largest um, slave holding county in the state of Georgia. Um, and uh, and so these civic leaders engaged uh, a nonprofit out of Richmond, Virginia, to to come in and have these facilitated dialogue sessions. Not to talk about policing, but to just talk about the experience of race um, and how both black and white Lagrange residents um, what it was like to live their lives. Uh, and they allowed them to kind of talk freely and talk openly about it. Um, and that was a very important uh, kind of trust building experience. And that's what uh, Chief Lou Deckmar got pulled into. And that ultimately led him uh, to make this remarkable, to do this remarkable gesture, which was to to be the first police chief, uh, the first Southern police chief to publicly apologize for his department's role in a lynching that had taken place back in 1940. So, you know, the community has to be in there, uh, not not yelling at the cops, but engaging in meaningful dialogue with them, sitting down, um, pressing their demands for justice, um, listening to what the cops have to say. And when that happens, when there's uh, the community and uh, chiefs uh, uh, and police leadership working together to produce change, you know, that can sometimes yield good results. Neil Gross, his book is Walk the Walk, How Three Police Chiefs Defied the Odds and Changed Cop Culture. Neil, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.